Welcome to Celtic State of Mind. My name is Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined by ex-Celtic goalkeeper Gordon Marshall. Gordon, welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thanks. It's a real pleasure. I mean, looking back on your, your football career, Gordon, it looks as though you were born to be a goalkeeper. Your dad was famously signed by Jock Steen back in the 70s during the first nine in a row period. Did your father ever tell you of Steen's treatment of goalkeepers, how he used to coach them, what his kind of attitude was towards them? Oh, he said he was tough. He said he was a very tough taskmaster with the goalkeepers. He ended up, I mean, uh, some of the pitches weren't as good as what they are now and it was uh, bottoms off and, you know, you, you were diving about on some horrendous training surfaces uh, and up against a quality, quality a group of players, squad of players at that time when he was there. Um, so yeah, he said it was a, it was tough. Um, but he he had also went through uh, you know some good times when he was at Hearts and Newcastle, and then coming up to Celtic. Um, so he was very very experienced. Um, so he kind of fitted in straight away with, with what was going on, and was well aware of the quality of the players that were at the club and. Um, and he, although it was short, he did enjoy his time there. I mean, when I look back on your career as well, one of these names, Gordon, that keeps cropping up when you're speaking to ex-pros is Jim Jeffries. And of course, you teamed up with Jim at Falkirk. How highly do you rate Jim in relation to the managers you've worked under? Uh, well, he was the only man that freed me twice. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was kind of mixed now. But he was... Uh, he, he, he had a great knack of identifying players. Um, if you were a player at a club, it could be a wee bit um, difficult dealing with the amount of people that used to come in into the club as trials, uh, with, sorry, having trials at the club, goalkeepers and all sorts of other positions. Um, so you had to be quite sort of strong-minded um, to, to play your position and carry on without all these distractions. But he always managed, Jim always managed to get good players and sign good players. Um, he was great at putting teams together, um, very tough, um, didn't suffer fools, knew exactly what he wanted. Um, and he, he, was, he was more, the times I had him at Falkirk and, uh, and Kilmarnock, he was very much sitting at the sides and watching. Um, and he would get a feel for things then. Billy Brown, his sidekick, was was in amongst the training and used to organise the training. Um, the only time that um, Jim Jeffries got involved with the training was, you know, he used to clap his hands and rub his hands and he thought, oh, no, here's the running coming. Because that was what he used to love. He used to line you up on the, on the line and everybody had to run at him and then go back to the line. But um, but very successful man. Um, uh, still see him now and again at the golf club. Um, and he's uh, glad to say he's, he's keeping a lot better than what he was uh, probably six months ago. So, you know, in the end, I, I probably, the older I got, I kind of respected what he'd done. The older I got, and a wee bit more aware of uh, other things rather than the, the sort of uh, being a wee bit selfish and think, oh, he doesn't like me because he keeps bringing in goalkeepers here. You know, the, the more you got used to him, the probably more, you better you worked. So, uh, no, in the end, I have, I have a, a, an appreciation for Jim now. Great to hear. Now, when the call finally came, Liam Brady was interested in bringing you to Celtic Park, Gordon, a legend of the game. You know, he'd gone away to UV, made a big, you know, splash over in Italy, and he comes into Celtic and he, he brings you in. At that time, how did you hear about the interest, Gordon? Um, the interest happened, we had just won the league at Falkirk, and uh, I was... At a do or uh, one of the sponsors do's um, at the end of the season, and somebody came up to me and uh, and said to me, "How would you like to join Rangers?" And I said, "Well, of course, of course, aye, no problem." I says, "Of course, I'll listen to anything," thinking it wouldn't go any further. Um, so I got a phone call for Rangers, and then the same day, I got a phone call for Celtic. We've been watching you. Why don't you come along and have a chat? I don't, I'm thinking this isn't real, you know. I said, we just won the league, and then all of a sudden, the two biggest clubs in the country are now asking you to sign. So, so it was a it was a strange time. I didn't have any agent. Uh, I thought I'm never going to get an opportunity like this again. 
Um, and I ended up going to visit both um, both managers, sat down, had a chat, uh, felt very much out my depth. <laughs> but I remember just asking the question, Rangers had signed Andy Gorham and, uh, and I'd said, you know, if, if I get in the team and I'm doing all right, will I, will I stay in the team? And Walter Smith said to me, no, we've just spent a million pounds on Andy, he's the number one goalkeeper. And I asked the same question to Celtic, and uh, and Liam said to me, he says, if you do well, you stay. And that was it, you know. Um, and I ended up, I signed with Celtic. And um, and I have absolutely no regrets about about my decision. Might earn a wee bit more money if I'd went to Rangers, but um, but no no regrets when I look back now. It's, it's a game you shouldn't have regrets. Yeah, you might do one or two things differently, but I don't have any regrets about what I've done. And uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed my time and I very much appreciated the, the opportunity that Liam gave me to, to join the club. When we look back to that, Gordon, as I was saying before, I've probably seen most of your games for Celtic and the Celtic you joined was very much a different club to the one you eventually left seven years later. But when you did join, there was a figure behind the scenes called Neely Mockin who had been a trainer at the time that your dad played for Celtic. And by the time you come along, he's a kit man. What's your memory? Is he nearly a bit of a joker by all accounts? Nearly was an absolute diamond. Lovely, lovely man. Because I'd been uh, playing at Falkirk, and nearly used to stay in the Falkirk area. So nearly used to just quietly walk past, and that was the way he used to do things. He'd quietly walk past and say, you all right, son? And he says, because I'll look after you. He says, you know, a Falkirk man. He says, that's where I'm from. I'll look after you. You keep yourself right. I'll look after you. And I remember being chuffed to bits that, you know, this um, legend of the club had, uh, had taken a, a bit of a shine to us. Now, whether that was because of the, uh, he knew my, my dad and uh, and had a respect for him. Um, Neely's knowledge of the game was was brilliant. And he, he, but he, he was very, very quiet man. Um, but he would just throw you in a couple of nuggets now and again, a couple of, you know, a couple of line, uh, lines, and and it he, he was great to go and to go and chat to, you know, if you weren't in the team or things weren't going as well, you know, he always had an ear for you, um, and would just either set you right or, you know, he would put an arm around you or he would chase you, whatever. Whatever, and he had a great knack of uh, knowing the the right things to say at the right times. Um, so I've got no a lot of fond memories of uh, Neil. He was a lovely man. Great to hear. When you came in, Gordon Liam had spent a fair bit of money. He brought in Gary Gillespie, Tony Mowbray, Tony Cascarino, uh, which were exciting signings for Celtic fans. Gordon, what what do you think was the problem at that time? Why didn't it work for Liam, particularly when he was bringing in big names from down south? Um, well, see that side of it was that's quite a difficult one for me to answer because you know, as I said, I you know I'd been uh, playing my football in a, a lower league, and and although it was quite a successful time at East Fife and and Falkirk, but when you go into Celtic, you know it's 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 not just the football; it's the whole thing. You know, you walk into this huge place uh, full of a lot of great people who have nothing but the best interest uh, at heart for the club. Um, but it seemed as though they had a, probably a tired board. You know, there was no sort of, no stimulation seeming, you know, coming from that area. You know, there was no excitement about, you know, can we sign better players? And and, and you, you always get compared with what happens across the road. Uh, and at that time, Rangers were signing, you know, um, household names. Oh, and uh, and I dare say, looking back, that you know you were kind of playing catch up a wee bit uh, with what was going on, and it probably didn't change until um, Mr. McCann came into the club, you know, and uh, and I think it was difficult. I think um, Liam definitely tried to bring in a, a better quality of player, more experienced players um, that had been successful at their clubs. Uh, and I try to kickstart the whole thing, um, but I, I do think it must have been really difficult for him at that time. Um, 
Plus, I'm sure that was Liam's first job as well as yeah. as manager, you know. So, so all that combination is, you know, very difficult. And so, yeah, it must have been really trying times for him. And certainly, as a player, you were trying to concentrate and, you know, playing. But with things, you know, you seem always seemed as though you were getting further and further behind um, Rangers, and that, you know. You know, when you work in Glasgow and that, you, you can't afford to let that happen. Um, so something was going to happen along the way, uh, and it eventually did. Um, it cost Liam his job. And as I say, it wasn't until uh, Mr McCann came out of the club that things kind of blossomed for there, or, or you know, fresh ideas, more ex- more exuberant sort of owner came into the club that knew exactly what was going on and and had a had a plan, you know, which was something important. Absolutely. I mean, see, when you joined the club, I think the Celtic fans looked at that changing room, Gordon, they looked at people like Paul McStay, Peter Grant, John Collins, a wee bit later Tom Boyd comes in. Who were they, the strong characters in the dressing room for you? Well, guys like Paul and Peter, uh, Derek White and all that, had won, you know, they'd won things with the, with the team. Um... It must have been very frustrating for them to be, you know, winning things only a couple of years earlier, and then and then the whole thing kind of crumbling round about. Um, and they were they were trying to sort of um, influence the whole thing in the dressing room towards you know the, how important it was. Um, and we had a we were kind of changing, you know, a, a number of younger lads breaking into the team. He had signed a few guys for down south. So it was all new in the dressing room, you know. So it must have been really frustrating for them. I don't know if I actually honestly sat down with them and, and asked them that sort of question. But I'm sure they would have found it frustrating while having such good times and then having the lows and wondering if the good times are going to come back. Um, so it must have been really frustrating. But everybody kind of understood after a short space of time how how big it is and how poor we were actually um, results were and league positions, how important it was to, to go and compete again instead of being third and fourth. I mean, that dear, dear, that's, that's unheard of, you know. So, um, so something had to change. Um, and it has to come as well with the players because they're the ones that are going out in the pitch and trying to change things. There was a couple of high points as well, Gordon. I remember the second season where you had that brilliant night against Cologne where we pulled it back 2 nothing down, we won 3 nothing. You must have looked around Celtic Park sometimes and thought, wow, this is a massive club or the potential is there for it to be a massive club again. Oh, I, I mean, undoubtedly. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> wow. I mean, when the place is going, it's there's nothing better. Um... And I, I dare say that's uh, probably, my, you know, the first old fun game, things like that, you know, and, and a big result, like you, you mentioned, the Cologne game, I think it was the first time um, that any club had turned over that sort of deficit from the first leg. Um, so, I mean, you, you get glimpses of that and all of a sudden, you know, it's, it hits home, you know, how important it is, your standards, to try and keep them up. Um and, and nights like that are for, you know, for me, when you look back in it, is wow. Um, and it's certainly, you know, when, when, when you see the team now, um, you get a wee feeling of what that must be like again, you know, for them. But I mean, they're sort of winning more regular now and, they're, you know, they're, they're the team to catch. Um, so it'd be around that atmosphere with the crowd because they certainly get involved. And when their team's winning, oh my goodness, I mean, it's... It's like a big truck coming right towards you. And I've, I've been on the end of that, you know. So we're playing against Celtic, you know, when I moved to Kilmarnock at Motherwell. And it's, yeah, it is. it does open your eyes and you go, wow, this is huge. You know, you were saying there about Fergus McCann coming in. During the period of the fan boycotts and the, the crowds being down and obviously, you know, McCarry coming in for a short spell, Gordon, what does that do to the players? I often wonder, how does that affect the morale in the dressing room, is it difficult for you to switch off from all of that and concentrate on the job at hand? Well, it was difficult because I remember we were over an island doing um, a strange tour. <laughs> it was strange. I mean, we were visiting cheese factories and we were, you know, I was thinking, what, what are we doing over here? And everything's kind of kicking off back home. 
Um, and the senior players were, were the ones that were informing you what's happening. You know, it's getting close, the takeover's going to happen. Um, so by the time we'd come back from then, it was all about to change. Um, and it was, it, yeah, it was uncertain times as a player because you had no idea if you were going to be part of the changes or not. But I remember when, uh, when Mr. McCann finally took over and he, he, had, he wanted everybody to be in one of the lounges up the stairs, everybody who worked at the club. And he, and he spoke and he, he spoke about how he wanted everybody to get on board with his ideas. And I remember afterwards, he, he was walking around the tables and he came over to our table and was sitting. Um, and I'm not sure it was uh, Andy Walker. I think Andy Walker, I, I'm not sure who the other one was. It might be Tony Mowbray, actually. Uh, and they were very switched on business-wise and all that sort of stuff. And, and I remember them rattling questions at Mr. McCann, you know, and, and he told you everything about all the different ways that the, the supporters could buy their season tickets, how many bags of chips and burgers they, could, they had to sell before they actually made a profit. Uh, and he, he, it was just mind-blowing when you just sat and listened exactly what he wanted, what he wanted to do, and it was now, here we go, it's going to start. And uh, and it ended up, they started to sign quality players. You know, um, Big Pierre was was a, was a big one, Andy Tom. You know, they, they signed in these two guys, all of a sudden thought, you know, I, it looks as though we're made in business now. And Davey Hay was involved with bringing these sort of players into the club and... Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, people were leaving and people were coming in. It was all new. It was all exciting. Um, then the, the, the quality started to change. Uh, when Tommy Burns came in, the, the style of play changed. Um, he, Tommy went away and came back after about 10 days. And all of a sudden, he was bedding in how we were going to play for that season. And it just, it just all ended up, you know, being an exciting place to be again. And uh, and it, it was it was it was brilliant to see that see that grow and see that develop, and uh, you know as I say the, the team they are now, but the, the, that was all the early stages. I mean he, even the huddle we went in Germany we went to Germany pre season tour, and you had a mixture of new guys you know older players, and uh, and the ones that had just signed. So it was everybody was in little pockets left right and centre, and I remember. And Tony just sitting having a meeting one night and he, he starts talking, we start discussing things. And the next minute we're we're in doing this doing this huddle in this in a, a pre season friendly game and it was just to bring everybody together. And once that happened, then you started to you know, we, we started to be a wee bit tighter, we started to be a bigger group rather than smaller groups. Um and all that was 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 guided by by Tommy Burns and and Billy Stark. You know, they they kind of thrived on seeing the team bonding a wee bit more, and what they put together on the training ground um, was was enjoyable. And all of a sudden, it was it was really enjoyable to get in, see things grow, and it was enjoyable to go in at training every day. Um, the enthusiasm of Tommy was just magic. The football we were playing was 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 tremendous. And it, it, it got the it got the supporters coming back in again because we were, we were we were exciting. There was even folk down south. Um, Any time that we were on the telly, you know, you hear stories back saying that we were the most exciting team to, to watch at that time in the telly, just the way we played the game. From a fan's perspective, Gordon, it was very exciting times. You know, it was. It did change things, and I know we, I know we didn't win the, the main prize and things like that till till later on, but. Um, but what Tommy done and, and what Mr. McCann done, you know, all sort of allowed other people to benefit from it later on. The few mentions you made there of Tony Mowbray sounds like a bit of a captain, a bit of a leader, Gordon. Would it be safe to say that he was? Oh, he was. I, yeah, we played in his testimonial game down in Middlesbrough um, and it showed you how big a character he was down in Middlesbrough. Um, captain of his club, um, and the reception he got down there for his testimonial was brilliant. Um, huge thinker of the game. Um, and uh, 
very emotional time for him up at Celtic as well. Uh, and we all kind of went through that sort of side of things. Um, but yeah, yeah, really strong character. And, and, and yeah, he did sort of bring people together in a way which was, which kind of tried to bring out the best in you as well. You mentioned Van Hooydonk there. I've spoken to Simon Donnelly, who obviously was a young boy at that time coming through at Celtic. And he says, he compares Van Hooydonk, he, he uses this expression, the Cantona effect. Van Hooydonk comes in and other people start playing better because you've got that added quality. From a fan's perspective, Gordon, it did look as though we were just bringing in better quality. Andy Tom later came in, then Cadet, then Di Canio. You played with all these guys. When you, you think of somebody like George Cadet, you were there that night when we played Aberdeen. You were on the pitch. As a fan, you know, we blew the radio station off air. What was it like? It was just like a cacophony of noise in there that night. It was. And unbelievable finishers at training. I mean, you see it firsthand at training, you know how hard Pierre hit that ball. It was unbelievable. His free kicks, I mean, he, his free kicks were outrageous. You know, uh, but a massive character, you know, very sort of, um, had an arrogance about him, but but he could carry it off, you know what I mean? Um, Andy Tom was, was a quality, acceleration, frightening, frightening. Um, Cadet as well, George, I mean, he's, the goals he used to score, he, quality finisher. Um, and Paolo as well, probably one of the best players I've played with. Um, could tie you inside out with, you know, um, with some of the, th- the skills that he done. When he was in your five-a-side team, it didn't matter what you done. You got the ball and you threw it at him straight away because you knew you would get either back into the game again or he would make something happen. Um, so any time, you, you know, you, you played these games and, and it, when the team won, it was just exciting. You know, it was great. And... and it was. They did. They did start to bring better players in, and I do think it was down to Davy Hay, who was heavily involved in these sort of things at that time. And it ended up, yeah, every everybody. You know, you had to step up your game because now the the quality of players were coming in. You know, you had to hang on there, or you know, be part of it, or you just fell away. So it was, yeah, it was great. Great. I really enjoyed playing with them. Great quality. Okay. Quality guys and quality uh, players. The Hamden season, Gordon, um, as a fan again, it was difficult. There was It was a Taily two cup finals and I know you don't like talking about the Coca-Cola cup final. That's fine because I don't like talking about it either. But after a game like that, how important is Tommy Burns to a player? If a player like yourself or Paul McStay needs picked up, what did Tommy do to try and motivate you guys, put his arm around your shoulder? I um, That's difficult because you know, I think... Tommy Hart as as much as everybody else. Um, the way the way he dealt with me, I think I played a few games and then we, I got dropped, you know. So um, it ended up, yeah. And I don't get any arguments for that, you know. Didn't do well when it came to that sort of occasion. Yeah, you deal with it better now, um, but it didn't happen on the day. Um, and listen, I dare say I'm I'm still one of these people that. I was at the club for seven years and I'm not saying that uh, I was liked or disliked or whatever, you know what I mean? And everybody will have their opinion on me. You know, that's, yeah. I was there seven years, so I must have done something right for that length of time, you know, the amount of people that are there. Um, so, um, Tommy was Tommy was great. I think the biggest thing about Tommy was, is that, you know, because of his enthusiasm, because he wanted more and he wanted the best out of you, and you, when you have a game like the, like the cup final, you just want to go back in and you want to go and, you know, the only way to apologise them or the only way to sort it is try and don't let it happen again and try and not let them down again. Uh, and that would be it. You know, you would have to... And, and when you're at Celtic, you've no got time to sort of mope about. Um, you know, because it ends up as you need to win every week. And, and that's... That is difficult. It's difficult to deal with, but that's if you want to play there. That's that's the rules. Um, so you, you, very quickly you have to, you know, try and dust yourself down and get on with it again. I didn't enjoy the hand up the hand in period. Um, I didn't think there was any sort of connection with, with the fans. It's not a stadium I enjoy. I think people are too far away from what goes on. Um, and I do think it was a, a, a season that you were just waiting to get back. Uh, a park kid and once we got back there 
I think everybody felt a lot more comfortable and a lot more in, um, familiar with their surroundings. I always remember, I was at the game so I didn't see it at the time, but when I came home and watched the Scottish Cup final, Gordon, I was amazed because you've got guys like Peter Grant and Paul McStay in tears and then you hand Brian O'Neill your, your winner's medal and Brian O'Neill's in tears. Was that just a spur of the moment thing, Gordon? You're talking about people putting their arms around you maybe when you were a younger player. That, that must have meant so much to Brian O'Neill that, that you did that for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, yeah, my, I see it a different way, you know, and the way I look at things, yeah, you've got to earn things. Um, I played the first round, uh, I think it was actually against Meadow Bank, and people might not even know who Meadow Bank are now, but, <laughs> but I played against Meadow Bank the first game. Uh, after that, Packy came in and played, um, and you know the team the team played well. Um, and what happened on the day? They they deserved a result. It was fitting that Pierre scored the goal, um, and and we, honestly, we really had the feeling that this was going to actually kickstart everything, and we were kind of going to win a hell of a lot more. Um, and what happened with Brian? Brian was unfortunate enough would have played in the final. Um, and he got injured in training, done his cruciate in training. And it just so happened when it, when we got our medals and all that sort of stuff, and it, I just turned and Brian was there. And I, I remember it was just a spontaneous thing. I seen him and, I, you know, and it, just a wee flash that he would have played. And I went and stuck the medal in his hand and I said, you would have played, you know, you deserve this more than me. And I gave him a medal. And, and later on that night, he came up to me and we went, when I win the second one, he says, I'll give you that one back. <laughs> you know, but he never did. He ended up moving down south. But, so I'm still waiting for that Scottish Cup medal. Oh, it was a brilliant gesture. It really was. And as you say, it did spur Celtic on. We went that fantastic season where we only lost one game, Gordon. So, so sad that we weren't able to win the league during that campaign for Tommy Burns, but for all the players as well. But see, the following season when... You know, Tommy finally did get sacked. I mean, what was the, the general feeling around the changing room? I know the fans were completely disappointed and a bit distraught because obviously we've got that relationship with Tommy Burns. Did you think he could have turned it round? Um, yes, I do because he, he, you know, he's uh, yeah, he was that sort of man that he could turn things round. Um, he wouldn't hide away from things. You know, he would go and face it. Well, no matter how bad it was, you know, he would get out there and he would, you know, take the lead. Um, the season before I mean that was my first um, full season it was my only full season at the club uh, and we we just missed out I think we had too many draws that year uh, we played a lot of good football probably deserved the league and it, I think the only game we lost was Parkhead 2-0 against against Rangers so and then uh, I can't remember how, how the whole thing worked out but it ended up yes he could have turned it around again. Yes, it would have taken a wee bit more of more signings, but a freshness about the place would have, would have certainly helped. Uh, but yeah, of course, he would have he would have turned it around. It was a it was a difficult time when he ended up when Tommy you know left the club. Uh, it was difficult for everybody because everybody just had huge admiration for him, absolute gentleman. Uh, and it ended up it was it was tough. But then you know you have to just get on with it. You know, it ends up that things come round quickly, the changes all happen, and all of a sudden it's right, OK, we've either, the ones who aren't playing, we've got a fresh start, um, and and it ends up, you just go, and whoever comes in, you hopefully you do enough to, you know, um, for him to keep you in the team, or for him to play you. And that's as quick, although it is, can be a really harsh game, and that side of things, but that's just that's just the way the game is. And that's just the way it happens. You know, the following season, Gordon, big changes. Vim Janssen comes in, different ideas, brings in um, his own players, one of whom is the one and only Henrik Larsson. Did you have a look at Larsson in the early days? Did you see a glimpse of what the Celtic fans were to enjoy in the years to come? Um, honestly, no, because I thought he was a really poor trainer. Uh, I thought he was... Um, I don't think he realised what he was coming into, um, whether he thought it was too easy or what. But I, I never thought he was, he, he was never a standout when it came to the, the training. He would come alive when we played wee games. Um, but the other wee bits and pieces, he, he never really sort of, he never really stuck out. And then one day, Wim had a go at him, half time, in Dutch, and he's absolutely nailed him. 
and this is for the most placid man you've ever met in your life. And he's had a right go at him. And it seemed as though things changed from then. He, he kind of, it was like as though the penny had finally dropped. Um, and he ended up just going from strength to strength. Uh, I was lucky enough that although I didn't play, I played the first game of the season, um, which was rubbish again because it ended up, I think I should have done better with the two goals that we, that we lost. And I lost my place. And I, but to be fair, I knew writing was on the wall. But come the end of the, the, the season before, and it ended up. So I got quite, I got quite close because I was standing or I'm on the sidelines uh, and watching the training. Gouldy had come into the team. I think Stuart Kerr was still there, and it ended up. I was kind of watching for the side and just picking his brains. And he was, he was great, really good to listen to. Very simple about what he wanted. Um, he allowed the experienced players that he had in the team now to kind of take charge of things on the pitch. He had a trust um, from these players. Uh, and he would never, for example, if you had, um, say, Jackie McNamara was injured. So the right back position, he knew his team on the Monday for the following Saturday. But if Jackie was suspended or something like that, all he was looking for was who was going to play right back from that. So that week he would be watching maybe three players all week. And then come the end of the week, he knew who he wanted to play and they would just go in and play. And it was as simple as that. Um, and as I say, we've been on the sidelines, I got an opportunity just to ask him, you know, what you're looking at today and, you know, what's happening here. And, and I got along quite well with him. And even when I moved on, he was, uh, he was always very chatty. Anytime we all had a get together where all the boys used to get together and if he was there, we always used to have a chat and sit down, how's things going, what you up, you know, and he and he was great. He had his mind around well all the time, Murdo, mm-hmm. who was uh, who was his shadow. So you never spoke to, to him unless Murdo was there as well. Um, but the two of them complimented each other brilliantly and went on to win the league, uh, which was uh, which was which was great. Which was great because it was only a matter of time with, as I say, the quality of the squad that they had then. And it was mainly a lot of good, experienced pros and along with the new generation that were that had kind of established themselves as well, you know, like Jackies and Simons and guys like that. Yeah. And one final question. You're talking about picking the brains of a coach. You've obviously gone into that world yourself, Gordon. You're now Aberdeen as a goalkeeper coach. There's a brilliant picture of yourself. I think it's Joe Corrigan. And there's a young Shea Given and maybe Brad Friedel's in on trial. One of the most bizarre things that, from a Celtic fan's perspective is the fact that we had young Shea Given there. We let him go and he, he goes to become a world beater. Did you see in him as a young guy, he had something and we should have kept a hold of him? Um, yeah, you definitely seen that. I mean, we, in that training group, that, that was unbelievable. And that was at the time when Liam Brady was there. Brad Friedel had come over and was having problem, red tape, couldn't get work permits, things like that. Um, so Brad was going about from club to club. And uh, he'd, uh, I'm not sure where it came from, if it was Joe Corrigan or somebody else knew. And, and Brad came in and trained with us for a good few weeks. Um, obviously, Packy was a senior one. Uh, who was there at the time and she had just come in and, and you could see straight away that she had, had something whether he would have been the, as good the goalkeeper or had the career he had had if he'd stayed at Celtic I'm not too sure because Terry General kind of took him under his wing when he went um, I think it was Blackburn and uh, and kind of brought him up worked with him day in day out I don't know if the same opportunities or the same type of quality goalkeeping coaching w- was there because we didn't actually have that at the time. Packy was brilliant to learn off, but was still a player uh, and was still very much part of the, the playing side. So I think that she had done the right thing, although, yeah, a lot of folk can argue, you know, she'd never let him go, but it happened. I think the decision was made. Do we keep Stuart Kerr? Do we keep she given? And at the time, Kerr's always probably... Um, a wee bit ahead of him because he had a, a couple of more years on him um, but she ended up going down south and uh, and I think Terry General was the one that was was mainly behind how well she had given done uh, and how well he he became you know he had great foundations where we're working with Parky with the national side and with she, mm-hmm. with she and also with what Terry done with him at Blackburn 
No, it's, it's, it's incredible to hear because as a fan, you just think whatever he'd done down there, he would have done it here. But as you have explained there, it might not quite have worked uh, like that, Gordon. It's been an absolute pleasure picking your brains about your Celtic career. Seven years at the club, you've seen the highs and the lows. And all that's left for me to say, Gordon, is thank you for joining me today on A Celtic State of Mind. No, I enjoyed it. It's nice to reminisce now and again. And as I say, the people all complain about even this interview. So <laughs> um, I've taken a lot from it. I've enjoyed chatting about things. It's brought back a lot of nice memories, a lot of good memories. And uh, and it's something that, that I'll have um, deep inside me because I know how big a club is and I know how, how many quality people work for the club. And I've, I've been lucky enough to be a small part of that. Now you take care of yourself, Gordon. Thanks, Paul. Cheers now. Thank you.